Uh, good morning. Uh, it's wonderful to see you all here, and uh, I think we're expecting even more people, so this is great uh, to have this last uh, final uh, workshop of uh, this program uh, being uh, so well uh, attended, and uh, I'm looking forward to seeing the results of it. Um, let me just introduce myself. I'm Ulrike Tillmann. I'm uh, the director here at the Institute. And as uh, Michael just reminded me, this is part of my job <laughs> uh, to introduce a workshop. So uh, um, let me also just say uh, just a few words for those of you who have, uh, haven't been to the Newton Institute before, and maybe even uh, <laughs> those who have been. Um, the Newton Institute is very much a uh, national institute. We are in Cambridge, we have to be somewhere located, uh, but it's very much a national uh, uh, institution, and we are trying to uh, support uh, mathematicians all uh, in the country, in the UK. Uh, so, in particular, uh, we um, have satellite um, um, workshop, but also satellite uh, programs now. Uh, and I hope uh, you might have already heard about it, where we have uh, programs at other uh, places in the UK um, that can run for months or even longer, uh, as you like and as the organizers uh, like. Um, I'm glad to see that uh, people, of course, take advantage of this wonderful building. It's not, uh, we are very lucky, um, we have 130 uh, square meters of uh, blackboards <laughs> that have been used <laughs> and a continuous uh, flow of uh, coffee, of course. Um, but uh, having said that we are like to be uh, all over the you know, national institution, I should also say we are very open. So when people want to come to the institute, we are very open to that and also, if you are here and you would like to speak at a, another in, uh, institution, we would support that and uh, pay for your travel. Um, let me also say uh, that we like to be open in a, a somewhat different sense as well, namely in a diversity uh, uh, direction. We are always very keen to support all um, members of the uh, mathematical community and attract those who are uh, maybe otherwise underrepresented to make sure uh, that they uh, feel welcome in our community and uh, we work together with them. Um, this includes also, we have special funding for uh, those who have families, special funding uh, uh, in uh, minority groups, and also uh, we have special funding for those who come from countries that are, uh, well, underdeveloped, uh, so there's special duck funding. Okay. Uh, enough from me, I hope. <laughs> the, the very last... Um, plead I have. I hope you enjoy this um, conference and enjoy in the interaction and you're very productive. When there is something interesting coming out of uh, your interactions here at the Institute, please let us know. And there are many ways you can let us know. Uh, of course, if you have a paper published uh, that somehow uh, uh, was instigated or has something to do with uh, the Institute, please um, quote the EPSRC number, which is uh, um, hung out over on the Institute. Um, but we also like to know if there's something special happening. We have these case studies. If there's something <coughs> that really um, makes a difference, that would be wonderful to uh, uh, have <coughs> you uh, represented in such a case study. Um, we also have a, um, a, a podcast series. Um, living proof. Uh, if there's somebody who like to be, uh, or you think m would make a fantastic subject uh, for that, let us know. Okay, with all of that, I think it's time to uh, pass on to the organizers of the workshop. Thank you, Ulrike. Yeah. So, uh, well, um, welcome everyone. Uh, I would like to welcome you also on behalf of the uh, other two uh, organizers of this workshop, uh, Mark Ofer and uh, Ted Johnson. I don't know where Ted is. Uh, yeah, okay. And um, yes, so um, as you probably know, this workshop is the fifth and last workshop of uh, the program called uh, Dispersive Hydrodynamics. Um, and uh, I've heard that the program has been very successful. So there were over 130 participants to the program. 
and overall with workshop with workshop attendees uh, uh, there were over two, 200 participants uh, so hopefully uh, this last workshop is going to be uh, successful as the entire program um, so this workshop is about uh, physical applications so we tried to make a uh, program that is sufficiently various and the idea was to have sessions with uh, different physical applications in each session. Uh, so we, we, we try to, to, to make that whenever possible. Hopefully these, uh, this will be okay to you and you will enjoy and this will also stimulate some discussions. Okay. So I said that, um, well, I also have to remind you that if you have mobile phones, you, uh, you should uh, turn them off. Otherwise, they will interfere with the microphone. And to those of you that are uh, following online, if you can please mute your microphones. And um, yeah, also the talks are going to be recorded and streamed online. And then we can uh, finally start. So our first speaker today is uh, uh, Gennady L from uh, uh, Northumbria University. And I'm pleased to say that Gennady is also one of the uh, program organizers. So it's really, really nice to have you opening this, uh, this workshop, Gennady. And uh, yeah, the floor is all yours. Thank you very much, Davide. Uh, thanks for giving me this opportunity. And well, I chose this topic for the talk solitary wave fission in dispersive hydrodynamics for several reasons. One, one of the reasons is, is it is a very general problem. And also many of the participants in this program have contributed quite importantly to this, uh, to this problem. And it is very appropriate, I think, for for the whole program uh, because it, it relates to actually all workshops uh, in this program. Okay, so first of all, of course, I would like to acknowledge my collaborators uh, on, this, on this particular problem and the, the work well, has spanned for quite a few years and uh, I will concentrate on the work that we've done with Mark Oefer and Michelle Maiden, who was kind of a driving force behind the experiments and theory uh, I'm going to uh, present. And also I would like to mention earlier work with Anatoly Kamchatnev, Roger Grimshaw and Noel Smythe that all uh, contributed to, to the theoretical part of this, uh, of this work. So well, obviously when we talk about soliton fission, uh, we start with the kind of first fundamental work of uh, Zabaski and Kraskal where they discovered solitons by uh, numerically modeling KDV equation with periodic initial data and, and what they observed. Of course, as we know, this uh, chain of, of pulses that uh, interacted non-trivially but remained intact uh, after this interaction and they call them solitons because of this particle light behavior. Uh, and then, well, of course, we know that uh, after that, the famous inverse scattering transform method uh, was, introdu was introduced. And uh, basically we can formulate kind of very general, actually conjecture, uh, which, which was motivated by the study of the KDV equation. And uh, what, what we observe in numerical simulations and some theoretical uh, developments that evolution of a broad localized disturbance in nonlinear dispersive medium results in, in a solitary wave train and dispersive radiation at large time. Uh, so this, this is kind of very general paradigm uh, coming from the KTV equation studies. And of course it's supported uh, by observations, by numerical experiments, by laboratory experiments. And the, the, here are a couple of important observations. There are lots and lots of them. The first one is about, well, sh showing tsunamis that sh showing tsunami disintegrates into, into these solitary wave trains. Uh, a similar effect is observed in internal waves, and there is a famous paper by Georgievich and Radikov who applied KDV theory to derive approximate soliton fission law. Uh, this is a nice picture from Farmer and Army. Uh, so, uh, it's, it's about internal waves uh, uh, interacting with, with, with a shelf, and we see these, these uh, oscillations which, which uh, represent sol internal solitary waves, and there are lots and lots of similar observations. Of course, we have experiments, and I would like to mention uh, what, a tank, what, what a tank experiment on the experimental realization of the Zabaski-Kraskal problem uh, by uh, 
Stefano Trillo and, and co-authors, well, Miguel Anarato, uh, Gino Biondini, and others, well, uh, Amin Chapshub. Uh, so this is experimental realization of the zabowski kraskow problem. And of course, I, I should mention, I couldn't help mentioning uh, recent experiments on soliton gas generation in water tank, where uh, creation of, uh, or disintegration of the initial uh, periodic disturbance uh, in a water tank led to, to this uh, collection of randomly interacting solitons that we call uh, soliton gas. And there are experiments on soliton fission in solids uh, by, by Karima and co-authors. And there are lots and lots of other experiments where this effect of disintegration of initial disturbance into solitons and some dispersive radiation have been observed. Of course, there is a huge body of work of an, uh, analysis uh, in, in, the, in this direction, and for integrable systems, it's basically we, we deal with well, counting eigenvalues in the IST problem, and the, probably the first significant work belongs to, to Carpon, and I'll, I'll talk about this. There are many, many other theoretical works uh, on that, uh, and generally, it's, it's, a, it's a kind of fundamental analysis problem in general, this solid resolution conjecture with contribution of many, uh, many, uh, important, uh, well, distinguished co-authors, uh, authors, and, and well, some of them uh, contributed to this program. It's Jerry Bona, uh, Bob Jenkins, Catherine Sulem, Ken McLaughlin. There are lots and lots of work. Well, Terry Tao, he's not a participant of this well, workshop, but well, too bad. Uh, anyway, so this this is a kind of three three different streams of research related to soliton, uh, solitary wave resolution. And I'll start with, with, with the work of actually Carpon that I mentioned at the very beginning. So uh, consider a KDV equation with small dispersion parameter. It's an appropriate model for dispersive hydrodynamics because in dispersive hydrodynamics we have this uh, scale separation, so it's, it's a small parameter with some positive, nice, broad initial data uh, decaying at infinity, and we know that I the, this, this initial value problem, well, uh, is associated with a linear spectral problem within the inverse scattering transform uh, machinery, and this is basically linear Schrodinger equation with the potential uh, being a solution of the KDV equation, and the, one of the important uh, results of the inverse scattering is that, that this, the KDV evolution conserves the spectrum of the Schrodinger equation, so it's isospectral. Now, if we consider epsilon small, we tend it to, to, uh, to zero, actually a reflection coefficient, which is responsible for, for continuous spectrum and for the dispersive radiation, uh, is vanishing, and that means that the long time asymptotic is dominated by solitons, by, by the discrete spectrum. So it's, it's, it, we can find this result in Lux and Levermore, but probably maybe even in Landau Lifshitz. Well, not about solitons, but reflection coefficients, of course. So, and we also know from quantum mechanics that discrete spectrum is distributed according to bohr zomerfeld quantization rule, which implies, and this is a work well, of Karpman, he just noticed this, in, as early as 1967, immediately after discovery of uh, solitons and inverse scattering transform, and it formally features in Widom's book. So the result, well, the, the outcome of the Borzomer-Feld rule is the soliton uh, amplitude distribution function because soliton amplitudes are related to the, to the discrete spectrum, and we can find the, the distribution of discrete spectrum from Borzomer-Feld rule, and we can find, therefore, distribution uh, density function for soliton amplitudes. And from here, we immediately see that the, the maximum amplitude, uh, the largest soliton has amplitude uh, equals 2 um, where um is the maximum of the initial disturbance. And integrating this density function, we get total number of solitons. Of course, it should be an integer, so uh, when, we, we, when we talk about this formula, it's, it's an asymptotic formula, so we take the closest integers, plus minus one, or, or integer part of of this, of this integral, and we get this nice formula for the total number of solitons emerging out of uh, this uh, initial broad disturbance, just integral of square root with, with some very specific coefficient. Okay, so uh, 
Now, we can approach this problem from a completely different perspective, from a perspective of reason modulation theory. And to illustrate this, why, why we do this at all, let, let's look at this simple simulation. So, and let me just, I'm going to stop it. And so, you see, we have initial broad disturbance, like a box. And when we evolve it, what happens here, we get development of what we call nowadays dispersive shock wave. Yeah. And this is dispersive shock wave emerging out of a step, basically. It's famous grayish Pitayevsky problem, but also the opposite, opposite uh, side of the box of, uh, produces rarefaction wave. And we know how to solve this problem. So, well, well, when we evolve it, well, the dispersive shock wave starts interacting with a rarefaction wave. And the whole process can be described within, totally within written modulation theory. And for the KDV equation, it's, it's, it, everything is known. We know Guidem equations. Uh, they are integrable. They have Riemann invariants. There is a famous uh, generalized holograph method. So we can solve this problem exactly in terms of uh, for the Guidem equations. And uh, the idea is just solve Guidem equations for this problem and let time go to infinity. So we solve it for intermediate time and then send time to infinity. And as a result, well, what we expect to get this. And indeed, this, this has been done in a series of work, works uh, uh, with contribution from, from Tamara Grava and Ferentian. Uh, and the result, if we construct this solution and send time to infinity, we get exactly the same Karpman formula for the distribution of solitons over amplitudes. And of course, then we get a total number of solitons. But, well, you see, this can be and has been done totally within Witten modul modulation theory framework. But Witten theory itself, it does not require integrability. We can construct Witten equations and study them to some extent uh, for non-integrable systems. And actually, in non-integrable systems, dispersive hydrodynamic non-integrable systems, we see at least numerically the same pattern. We start with initial disturbance, we get a bunch of solitons, sometimes we get well, some small radiation, but maybe uh, in many cases, the, this uh, contribution of radiation could be neglected and we can deal just with, with solitons. Okay, so we explore this, this possibility. And so the key idea is to use with modulation theory to describe solitary wave fission in non-integrable dispersive hydrodynamics. And this, this has been done for a number of equations. We did this uh, with with Anatoly Kamchatnov and, and uh, Ardalda Gamal, uh, Eduardo Hamis, who also contributed uh, in this, in this uh, workshop, Roberto uh, Krankel. And uh, so the method that I'm going to, to report today actually was introduced some time ago in our paper with, with uh, Roger Grimshaw and Noel Smythe. And we developed this for uh, Sir green nadi equations, which are actually uh, bidirectional and they are more complicated than unidirectional kind of non-integral generalization of the KDV equation. Uh, but I'm going to concentrate today on the application of this theory, this method to the conduit equation, which is a unidirectional non-integral equation. And the reason is uh, because this equation is, first of all, it's very nice, but also it is supported by very uh, precise uh, experiments, so we can compare not just with the numerical simulations, but also with, with physical experiments. And this is, again, very appropriate to this workshop on applications. And uh, I'd like just to mention that uh, very recently a complementary approach, uh, but basically uh, converging to the same point with the same result for the number of solitons uh, was developed by Anatoly Kamchatnov. So from the very beginning, uh, to avoid any complications, I would assume that uh, we, we have, for the Widom equations, we have strict hyperbolicity, genuine nonlinearity. These assumptions are quite difficult to verify in many cases, but we, we assume that we have kind of KDV-like non-integrable dispersive hydrodynamics. Uh, and our fundamental, of course, assumption will be that this resolution into dispersive, uh, uh, dispersive shock wave uh, following by the, uh, uh, by, by, by the 
formation or train of solid mass. So talking about dispersive shock waves, just briefly let me mention, just describe the structure of dispersive shock wave. It, it represents modulated periodic solutions. So uh, locally it, it is described by, by periodic solution of our, our equation, whatever equation is. And we assume that it is parameterized by just three parameters, which is the case uh, often, and it is the case for the conduit equation, uh, say amplitude, wave number, and the mean. We could choose other set of parameters, but these are more convenient and the, these, these are physically inspired. Then we allow these parameters to be slow functions of x and t, and we can derive equations for these three uh, parameters by either uh, averaging uh, conservation laws or by uh, applying multiple scale expansions or averaging Lagrangian. In any case, we, we get this quasi-linear system for this state vector, a, k, uh, u bar, and this is what is often called modulation matrix. Could be very complicated. Uh, and the structure of dispersive shock waves, so locally it is, uh, it is uh, uh, traveling with a solution, uh, uh, periodic solution, but it's modulated and in a special way, such that uh, the, it, it starts with the solitary wave, where the wave number goes to zero. It's a definition of solitary wave, and it propagates with the, with the solitary wave speed, and we have Typically, we have the uh, speed amplitude uh, relation for, for solitary wave, and this determines the leading edge. We assume negative dispersion, so uh, this orientation of, of, uh, of dispersive shock. And the opposite edge, the oscillations, uh, they, they degenerate, and we get uh, harmonic oscillations here. Amplitude goes to zero, and we call it, well, this is a trailing edge, and it propagates with group velocity. So this is very general structure of dispersive shock wave. So, uh, and to describe these modulations, we derive this with modulation system, and we supply this system with some free boundary conditions introduced originally by Gravich and Petayevsky, uh, and we say that at the trailing edge, which we don't know, it's, it's, it's a nonlinear problem, we, it's uh, determination of this uh, edge is part of, uh, of the solution, at the trailing edge amplitude goes to zero, and we match the, the mean value in the dispersive shock, shock wave with the external, non-dispersive uh, flow, which is described dispers by dispersional limit. For instance, in the KDV equation, it would be just solution of the Hopf equation. And the same type of matching we have at the leading edge, where instead of amplitude, uh, the wave number vanishes, and uh, the, uh, the mean value is uh, attached to, well, it, it is connected to the solution of the dispersional limit to the Hopf equation. So it's, it's kind of uh, standard formulation. And now, how, do, how are we going to extract information about solitary waves from, from this? Well, we want to compute, well, we want to have some soliton count counting function. And this function is present already in the William theory. It's a wave number. If we assume, and this, this is our key assumption, which we support by numerical simulations, uh, that this problem with broad, well, dispersive hydrodynamic problem with broad localized initial disturbance, all oscillations in dispersive shock wave convert into solitons, into solitary waves. Uh, this is not obvious at all, but we make this, this kind of conjecture, which we will confirm by numerical simulations. Uh, and as I said, well, we have a very nice uh, oscillation counting function, which is the wave number which is, is already in the Widom theory, and we have this fundamental uh, wave conservation law, which, which, which is behind the whole modulation theory. It's just the existence of slowly modulated uh, single phase waves. It's just a condition of the mixed equality of mixed derivative of the phase, okay? So, and it is a conservation law. So if we assume that there is nothing at infinity, uh, that uh, then we can compute the number of oscillations which will presumably become solitary waves just by computing this integral and of, of, of k. And if we know this k at the initial moment of time, which is not obvious at all because initially we have just this broad, smooth initial condition, but... Uh, well... <laughs> We, it's, it's always, well, I already mentioned, it's, it's asymptotic theory. We take the closest integer. Okay. Of course, it's not integer, yeah. of course. Uh, so uh, 
if we are able to find initial condition, uh, so the idea is that we, we determine using Wheaton modulation theory, the wave number at this point where oscillations just, just get uh, generated, just zero amplitude uh, edge. Yeah? And if we find the wave number along this edge, we are able actually, and this is what I'm telling you, it's a result, to project this to the, to the X axis and find initial condition for this wave number using with the modulation theory. And then we integrate it and, uh, and we get total number of waves, which, which are solitons eventually, solitary waves. So this is the strategy. So we determine the wave number at the trailing edge and then reconstruct initial, initial, uh, initial uh, data for this wave number and then integrate it. So how is it done? How is it done? Let's consider very general uh, dispersive hydrodynamics with initial conditions in the form of uh, a nice hump and uh, we assume that everything is convex. So this hyperbolic uh, flux is convex, dispersion relation, linear dispersion relation is, is convex. For, for convenience, we assume that it's negative dispersion. So we have this orientation of dispersive shock wave. And quite generally, we can show, uh, and this can be, can be shown rigorously and uh, also, well, I, I could, should, should mention, uh, works uh, by uh, Sylvie in this, uh, this uh, regard uh, and co-authors. So the modulation system in this uh, zero amplitude limit corresponding to this trailing edge uh, can be just, the, it reduces to this nice system of two equations, wave number conservation law, where we have just linear dispersion relation, it's linear waves, and we have this dispersionless limit actually for the, for the mean. This can be derived quite generally. So we have these two equations. And this is hyperbolic system with, well, with these two characteristic velocities. One of them is hyperbolic velocity, lo, lo, it's long wave, well, sound speed if you want. And uh, another one is uh, group velocity. And the harmonic edge, as I mentioned already, coincides with the linear group velocity characteristics. But it's a characteristic. So we cannot specify independently wave number and the mean, these two quantities, on a characteristic. So there must be some relation between them. And this relation, this, uh, the simplest way to find this relation, okay, we can diagonalize this system, fi find the Riemann invariance and make it constant. And this will give us this relation between these two quantities. But well, the simplest way to do this is ju just uh, fi find the simple wave curve. So we assume that k is some function of, of u. We substitute these answers into equation and we get an ordinary differential equation for this k minus this function, uh, which gives us this relation between the wave number and the, the mean value all at, the, at the trailing edge. So this is nice uh, ordering differential equation. And the trick here, it's important uh, that well, we, need, we need some initial condition for this ordering differential equation. And it is specified uh, by the condition that for the, uh, if we consider k at the opposite edge of the dispersive shock wave. And it follows from the, uh, these matching conditions that I, I presented in the earlier slide. Uh, this this uh, wave number should be zero. It should be consistent with, with, the, with, the, uh, with the leading edge as well. So from this uh, equation, we get this uh, dependence of K on U for the leading edge, for the trailing edge, and then as I mentioned already, we just need to project this onto the x-axis, and this is done along characteristics of, of this uh, simple wave equation. And basically, we just re the result is that we replace this u bar with the initial condition, and we get this uh, total number. Well, we get the in initial condition for the wave number integrated, and the, we get total number of solitary waves. And as a toy example. We consider how it works practically for the KDV equation. We say have KDV equation with linear dispersion relation. We just substitute this linear dispersion relation and this, this flux into the ODE, very simple ODE with this initial condition. Uh, and uh, we solve it immediately, project onto the X axis, substitute the formula, and we get exactly the same Karpman formula without any use of inverse scheduling transform, without any use of integrability. We get this formula, and the, this is exactly the same coefficient. 
So quite remarkable. And now we can apply this uh, to some specific non-integrable system. Uh, and th the other side of the story is this uh, solitary wave distribution, uh, which is a little bit more complicated. But the idea is that well, we make some kind of, we call it lambda sections of the initial profile and compute the number of solitary waves emerging out of this particular chunk of the initial profile. And then we can combine this information into, into the solitary uh, wave, well, the, into, into this cumulative uh, density function for the amplitudes. So it's a little bit more, more complicated, but the idea is the same. And it also involves kind of a conjugate set of, of, of conjugate uh, or characteristic ODE for the leading edge. So we have this conjugate wave number, conjugate uh, dispersion relation, but everything, well, I would like to stress, everything that is computed here is just in, ter in terms of two ingredients. We have hyperbolic, nonlinear hyperbolic flux, of the, uh, which, which we extract from the equation and linear dispersion relation. Everything, what, what we, all information about solitons are uh, extracted, is extracted from, from these two ingredients. And now I apply these ideas. Seven. <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, so I apply this, this setting to, uh, to a very specific physical system this, this famous uh, viscous fluid conduit uh, that uh, Mark has extensively studied in his, in his lab. So it's, it's low Reynolds, high viscosity contrast uh, flow, uh, Stokes flow. We have glycerin with two, and, and diluted glycerin, which is injected inside and forms this liquid pipe, liquid conduit. And the, it's quite remarkable, despite that we, we're dealing with uh, viscous liquids, uh, Viscous fluids, we, we have uh, for the cross section of, of this liquid conduit, we have nonlinear dispersion relation, uh, nonlinear dispersive equations, dispersive hydrodynamics. And it describes fully nonlinear waves in this conduit. And there are some famous classical soliton experiments on this. And as I mentioned, this has been extensively studied by Mark and collaborators. And this is a remarkably good uh, e uh, equation and system, well, a platform, if you want, a, uh, experimental platform for dispersive hydrodynamics. S the equation itself is non integrable It doesn't pa pass pin levet test. It has just two conservation laws. It has traveling waves, solitary waves, weed modulations, D DSWs, uh, studied uh, by Mark and uh, uh, Michelle and, and, and uh, Nick Lohmann. Uh, and this is, well, the result, well, the solitary wave fission example of which is initial kind of box data, which produces this, these solitary waves. Everything is vertical, actually. Uh, and this is comparison of uh, modeling, well, just numerical simulation of the equation and the experiment. And you see how remarkably well uh, this, uh, this equation works for the, uh, for the, uh, for the theory, for, for the exp uh, equation works for the experiment. So, we just have this equation. We extract these main ingredients that I already mentioned, this hyperbolic speed, linear dispersion relation, and we also need solitary wave speed, uh, ampli speed amplitude relation, which are available for this equation, so these, these ingredients. And we assume, as I said, hyperbolicity of modulations, pure solitary wave resolution, which is confirmed by numerical simulations, as we can see here. So this is an example of some box resolving into chain of solitary waves, and this is just integrals, there are two integrals of this equation, and uh, we just compute this for, we, we can estimate solitary wave contribution and, uh, and the radiation contribution, which is radiation contributes less than 1% here. So the solitary wave resolution conjecture uh, quite well uh, works for this system. And this is a result that well, just by apply, applying this machinery, we just get a formula for the, uh, we start with the initial box of uh, width uh, W and height uh, AM above a background of, of unity. And this is a nice uh, exact result for the, for, the, for the number of solitons emerging out of solitary waves emerging out of this box. It is linear with the width. If we make small, a small amplitude expansion, uh, we get, we reproduce the KDV result as expected exactly with these square root of six and everything. Uh, large, am uh, large amplitude expansion is also interesting. And this is comparison uh, with the experiment. 
So this asymptotical results obtained by, by from this formula and this experiment, uh, so the, 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 uh, this line corresponds to one-to-one -one correspondence and we are always within one, one, two solitons away. And uh, the, the accuracy uh, improves, of course, with the, with, uh, with as any increases as expected. And finally, I'll present the result just within one or two minutes for the, it's more kind of more involved analysis uh, here. Uh, so we, we can compute normalized uh, cumulative density function for box. And this is again, this is the result following for these ODEs, characteristic ODEs and some extra analysis. Uh, and this is this, this formula. And of course, this, uh, this formula, by the way, it gives us, for instance, very, very uh, nice uh, quantitative result for largest soliton amplitude. And when we make small amplitude expansions, we reproduce again KDB results, which is, uh, which is very reassuring. And this is a uh, final slide. Uh, it's a comparison of the observations, experimental observations. Each step here corresponds to, to a soliton. Uh, uh, with the, well, this uh, black line is the theory, this is a dotted theory that we developed, and this dotted line is KDV. And we see that, well, when number of soliton increases, it, it follows, well, experiment follows quite nicely. The, the theoretical curve and KDV is well, completely off. So uh, this is the theory for actually uh, genuine uh, large amplitude waves. It works very well, and of course, in the limit of small amplitudes, it, it it uh, agrees with the KDV. So conclusions, so we developed solitary wave resolution method based on wheel modulation theory. We observed soliton number and amplitude distributions in viscous fluid uh, colloids experiment. There's very good quantitative uh, agreement with the theory. And of course, what is lacking, and it's probably very, very difficult, but this is what, what we are hoping for, rigorous proof of this, uh, of this approach. And well, these are, these are these two papers on which everything is based. Thank you. Thank you, Gennady. Yes, a uh, couple of quick questions. In the meanwhile, I can I invite the next speaker to maybe join? It's a really lovely result. Thank you for presenting it so clearly. I'm wondering if you thought about the uh, bound offered by CAM theory as a point where your formula for the number of solitons might start to break down. Have you looked at that potential connection? So, what? In other words, if you, if you perturb off of your integrable system far enough, yes. then you hit the bound of CAM theory, K-A-M theory, right? Kolmogorov the Arnold Moser theory. When, when, when you perturb off an integral ah. system far enough, you hit a bound. And past that yes, point, you get yes. chaos. Well, uh, and then your number of solitons may start to, your number of solitary waves prediction may start to break down. Have you thought about comparing your, the limits of applicability of your formula to that bound to see if there's a connection or not? Well, I mean, we, we start here with already the system which, which is non-integrable at all. It's not a perturbed integrable system. It's, it's completely non-integrable system. And the, the, the whole idea is that the, well, this with the modulation theory, modulation, uh, it, it, it's just applicable to non-integrable systems. Of course, rigorous proof is, is far away. Uh, and we confirm the va validity of our assumptions using numerical, uh, numerical simulations. But generally, you're right, well, you, you can have some integrable systems and by introducing uh, perturbation, you, you can just well, get, you can break some of the assumptions here. And then, yes, you're right, well, you, you get different numbers, so it's <laughs> uh, <well. laughs> uh, <laughs> got it. Okay. Um, thank you for this talk. Uh, if I understand correctly, um, the usual zero level with M theory uh, gives you a number of oscillations, uh, which is time dependent if you integrate between the two boundaries uh, x you correct. denoted correct. x plus That's and correct. x yeah, minus, correct. and only. Uh, at t equals zero and t infinity, kind of the two results match. Correct, but, but because but we are interested in total number. Yeah, but could you get a time-dependent uh, result for yes, for yes, yes, of course. We, well, I, I didn't didn't present, but it, it's possible, totally possible. Yeah, okay. just integrate over over the over the, over the DSW region. Yeah. 
yeah. And, and, okay. yeah. It will grow, and eventually it will, it will uh, asymptotically uh, approach this, this result. Yeah. Thank you all for the nice. Okay, thank you for the presentation. I just had one question. So, a long time ago, I tried numerically with a spectral code to count the number of solitary ways um, generated in the Benjamin Ono equation, yes. which is, by the way, integrable. Yes. Well, I found that the tolerance that I set, you know, so how do you know what is the smallest solitary wave? It's not that simple, actually. I agree. Yeah. I agree. So yeah. I'm not sure even that it's a well-defined number if you really w and the experiment must be similar. Yeah, I mean, of course, these these are asymptotic asymptotic results. And we can always lose one two solidons here, which which contribute to these smallest bits. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So basically, yeah, okay. so it's not an exact result. No, no, it's it's a asymptotic result, but it's it's a, a, as as exactly as asymptotic as, as you get from from the KDV equation from the integrable theory. You just uh, apply basically Borzomer-Feld rule. Yeah. yeah. So it's it's plus minus. Who cares about one two solid? No? <laughs> Beautiful theory, but how, how how does it work in time? In the sense that, do, do I initially see all the solitons? They're just very small and very compact. And then this fan, uh, you know, so suppose I'm going to compute this numerically. Yes. In, 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 the, in the equation, yeah. is the number n, which is fixed in time in your problem, yeah. um, apparent immediately? Uh, in, in a careful you see, numerical okay. calculation. A numerical, no, in numerical simulations, you would see the, the kind of emerging or generated at this uh, trailing edge as a small amplitude oscillations that grow. Right. And, and in time, it, it, will, it, will, it will be, if you just consider oscillations within this wedge, uh, it, it will be finite and, and growing in time. But we compute the whole integral, so it, it takes into account all kind of hidden potential oscillations there. Right. Okay. Which which develop. So I mean, this is what what we see with what we see in numerics. Uh, these oscillations are generated, and they gradually develop into solitary wave. But solitary wave. Number yeah. of solitons become self-solitons. Number of solitons. Well, you, you can conserve. Uh, it's it's not an integral. So the no, no, I'm talking about integral only. No, no, no. Doesn't doesn't matter. Well, what is conserved uh, given by conservation laws? There is no conservation law for. Uh, so it you have you have some. Well, the mass, for instance, is conserved. Well, momentum, energy. Uh, it, it was more, you know, yeah. It was more about I'm trying to continue question, previous question. Yes. So if, if it is integrable equation, and you look at the dynamics in time. Yes. So if it is integrable, yes. uh, number of solitons should be in the initial conditions, of course. right? Yeah, of so course. And the structure, indeed. So that's, yeah. Yeah, well, you're right. Okay. I mean, number of solitons is already kind of hidden in the initial condition. It's, okay. It just kind of emerges. It develops mm -hmm. with, with time. And you see this uh, at large T asymptotic. <laughs> so maybe can I suggest to continue the discussion okay. later on so that we make room for our next speaker? So thanks again, Adi, again.